Hello there, my name is Dr. Mark Rolfe. I'm the Medical Director of the Lung Transplant Program at Tampa General Hospital and the President of New Lung Associates, the Lung Transplant Pulmonary Group at Tampa General Hospital. In this presentation, I'd like to outline the indications for lung transplant, the timing for lung transplant, and the long and short-term complications of lung transplant therapy. The science of solid organ transplant is a relatively young science. The first attempt at a lung transplant was made in 1963 at the University of Alabama. Between 1963 and 1981, subsequent attempts at this operation met with early failures as the transplanted organ was rapidly rejected. With the advent of new immunosuppression, in 1981, Stanford University completed the first successful heart-lung transplant, followed in rapid succession in 1983 by the first successful single-lung transplant being performed at the University of Toronto. In 1985, University of Toronto performed the first successful double-lung transplant, and in 1993, Stanford University took the lung, or a lobe of the lung, from a living donor and transplanted into a recipient. Today, lung transplant is an accepted surgical and medical procedure for patients who have end-stage lung disease with a life expectancy of less than 50% at two years, in whom all other forms of therapy have been exhausted. In addition, these patients should have no underlying comorbidities that would otherwise shorten their life expectancy. Beyond the broad criteria of less than a 50% two-year survival without transplant, indications for lung transplant are based on expert opinion rather than on randomized controlled trials. Indications may vary from center to center depending on local expertise, donor supply, and societal values. The most difficult task for the transplant pulmonologist is determining the window of opportunity for transplantation. Ideally, the patient should be ill enough to require a transplant and expect improved life expectancy, but not too late such that the transplant itself shortens the life and quality of the life. The truth of the situation is that the lung disease normally does not progress in a linear fashion. It can wax and wane in severity as the disease progresses. The challenge for the transplant pulmonologist then is to pick that window of opportunity to list and transplant the patient before the disease process extracts such a toll on the body that there's too great a morbidity and mortality associated with the transplant process. This slide depicts the normal disease process for which lung transplants are performed. For single, double, and total lung transplants, the most common indication is COPD or emphysema, followed closely by idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, cystic fibrosis, alpha-1A trypsin deficiency, idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension, other diseases of fibrosis of the lung, bronchiectasis, sarcoid, obliter obliterated bronchiolitis and retransplant, connective tissue disease associated lung disease, and LAM. A number of other relatively rare diseases are also considered for transplant based on the individual cases as presented. In determining who is a candidate for lung transplant, there are recognized absolute contraindications to transplant. These include ongoing infections that will affect long-term survival, including HIV, hepatitis B or C, and active tuberculosis. There's also other organ system dysfunctions that limit the opportunity for lung transplant, include Included in these are inoperable coronary disease, active liver disease, including cirrhosis from hepatitis C and alcohol, severe renal insufficiency with creatinine clearances of less than 50 ml per minute, and other end-stage organ disease processes. The stress of the surgical procedure associated with lung transplant and the subsequent immunosuppression limits the potential for transplant in several conditions. These include significant coronary disease and renal dysfunction, active HIV disease, active malignancy within the last two years, and in the last five years for extracapsular renal cell carcinoma, stage 2 through 4 breast cancer, Dukes B through D colon cancer, and melanoma. In addition, patients with active hepatitis B and C are not candidates for transplant as the additional immunosuppression will result in fulminant hepatitis and liver failure. A number of other medical and social issues limit the potential for lung transplant. These include severe osteoporosis, in which steroid use after transplant will result in vertebral body collapse and hip fractures, which will limit the quality of life and life expectancy of the transplant recipient. Chronic narcotic use is an absolute contraindication, 
because after transplant, we will be unable to control the pain and the patient will linger in the ICU, unable to be weaned from mechanical ventilatory support because of lack of adequate pain control. The lack of social support after transplant is an absolute contraindication as there is a great deal of work that goes into taking care of the patient in the immediate post-op phase in the hospital as well as at home for the first three to six months. The medications and co-pays associated with lung transplant and the immunosuppression are significant and financial limitations arise that will limit transplant options for some people. Anyone who continues smoking is not a candidate for lung transplant. The smoke will increase the risk of acute and chronic rejection and limit the survival of the graft and the patient. Any poorly controlled psychiatric issue that could be exacerbated by the transplant procedure and immunosuppression is a contraindication, as is an intolerance to post-transplant meds, particularly steroids. Any hypercoagulable state in which the patient is prone to developing clots, DVTs, and pulmonary emboli is also a contraindication for lung transplant. A severe chest wall deformity, such as severe scoliosis or kyphoscoliosis, results in a chest cavity that is unable to accept a normal lung, and hence a contraindication of lung transplant. Severe and irreparable esophageal disease, such as achalasia and severe reflux, are relative and absolute contraindications to lung transplant, as a continuous reflux of stomach contents into the lung will result in graft dysfunction and acute and chronic rejection. Progressive systemic diseases such as active lupus and underlying vasculitis are also contraindications as other organ systems will suffer at these diseases, limiting the potential for the quality of life and longevity of the organ and the patient. A certain type of Burkholderia known as Senosopatia or Genomavar 3 Burkholderia that is seen in CF patients is also an absolute contraindication to transplant as there are no effective antibiotic therapies for this and post-transplant sepsis and death are more the, exception, are more the rule than the exception. Just as there are absolute contraindications to transplant, there are relative contraindications to transplant. These include musculoskeletal diseases such as scoliosis that is not overly severe. Nutritional concerns such as an ideal body weight less than 70% or greater than 130%, which can be corrected and adjusted in the pre-transplant period. A history of psychological issues that can be ad addressed and dealt with in the pre-transplant stage. A history of mechanical ventilatory support, colonization with fungi or non-tuberculous mycobacterium, severe deconditioning, and previous thoracotomy with pleurodesis limit transplant options but are relative contraindications that are dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis. Both single and double lung transplants can be performed. The indications for single lung transplant are predominantly pulmonary fibrosis, sarcoid, bronchiectasis, and congenital heart disease, as well as LAM and some connective tissue disease, as well as retransplant for chronic rejection. For the most part, patients who do not have a septic lung condition, such as bronchiectasis or chronic infection in both lungs, whether they be from typical bacteria or atypical mycobacterium and fungus, are candidates for single lung transplant as long as they don't have associated severe pulmonary hypertension. Double lung transplants can be performed for most of the same indications as single lung transplant, depending on the availability of the organs. The most common indications for double lung transplant include cystic fibrosis, COPD, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, pulmonary hypertension, and alpha-1A tryptin deficiency. In patients with pulmonary hypertension or infected lungs, as you see in cystic fibrosis or chronic bronchiectasis, the preferred procedure is a double lung transplant to prevent the pulmonary hypertension that exists in the native state from damaging the recently transplanted lung and from secondary infections from the non-transplanted lung infecting the transplanted organ. A double lung transplant, especially on cardiopulmonary support, is a dramatically more involved surgical procedure than a single lung transplant, especially off pump. There is a short term cost of a double lung transplant, especially one performed on pump, including increased reperfusion injuries, blood use, and post op intensive care support. In the long term, five year survival is essentially equal in one and two lung transplant patients. It's not until after the fifth and sixth years that there's a small but statistically significant improvement in survival in those who received a double lung transplant over those who received a single.
This slide depicts the number of single versus double lung transplants from 1985 through 2009. As you can see, the number of double lung transplants has risen significantly over that period of time. However, there are still a remarkably steady number of single lung transplants performed, often for the same indications as I mentioned above, an inability and an increased risk for double lung transplants either because of previous thoracic surgeries or low availability of double lung transplant donors. I would now like to talk about some general guidelines for patients undergoing transplant consideration for COPD and emphysema. Transplantation for COPD and emphysema is often a quote unquote lifestyle transplant. That is, there's a trade off of oxygen, nebulizers, and general pulmonary care for the risks and benefits of immunosuppression. With the current lung allocation score, transplant for COPD is increasingly unusual due to the fact that patients with COPD usually have lower lung allocation scores than other patients. It becomes even more difficult when you consider alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency in which these patients can survive for years and years and years even with pulmonary functions with FEV1s in the 20 to 25 percent range. A method to determine the risk of death in patients with COPD is a calculation of the Bode score. There are four factors that increase the risk of death in patients with COPD. These are your body mass index, the degree of airflow obstruction, the dyspnea, and the exercise tolerance in a six-minute walk test. Patients with higher Bode scores are at higher risk of dying from COPD, and the Bode score has a stronger ability to discriminate the probability of survival among patients with the same FEV1. The Bode score also predicts hospitalizations better than FEV1. This slide demonstrates the four basic components of the Bode score and their associated score value associated with the disease process as determined by, in the case of the FEV1, an FEV1 greater than 65% receives a zero Bode score, whereas an FEV1 less than 35% receives a point score of three. The same can be seen as far as the distance walked, the dyspnea scale, and the BMI. Note that the body mass index greater than 21 or less than 21 is assigned either a zero score or a one score and no three and four point score is possible. Once this table is filled out for an individual patient, the score is added up and a definitive Bode score number is then available. This slide demonstrates the four year survival of patients with COPD with the assigned Bode scores. As can be seen in this slide, a, a score of 0 to 2 is associated with an 80% four-year survival ship, a score of 3 to 4, a 67% survival ship, a score of 5 to 6, a 57% survival ship, and then when the score becomes elevated to the 7 to 10% range, there is approximately 8% survival ship. The goal of transplant, as mentioned before, is to transplant patients with a less than or equal two-year survival. Extrapolating this data roughly, we would be expected to be seeing patients for transplant when their Bode scores are in the five to nine range, uh, as this is a time when there's a potential for improved survival with transplant in spite of immunosuppression uh, and the surgical intervention. Unfortunately, there are significantly more potential recipients than there are donors. In the past, to get a lung transplant, you had to be listed and wait your turn on the list. At times, this wait may be two to three years. This unfortunately led to a disproportionate number of patients dying while waiting on the list from advanced lung disease, while less sick patients would last on the list and subsequently be transplanted. In May of 2008, UNOS and the United States government put forward a lung allocation score system to better qualify and, and quantify the severity of lung disease and the benefit of transplant for lung transplant recipients. With this method, the most ill patient receives the donor offer before the less ill patient and time on list and mortality on the list is significantly reduced. The lung allocation score is determined by ranking and scoring various features of lung disease, including pulmonary hypertension, 
whether you're on oxygen, how far you can walk with and without oxygen. The formulation then results in a score. And this score basically determines how bad you need the lung versus how well you'll do without it. The score applies to patients who are transplant candidates over 12 years of age, and the range can be from 0 to 100. The good thing about the lung allocation score is that as your disease progresses, the score can be updated, giving you a higher, higher score and more and more likelihood of being offered a lung for transplant. This slide depicts the various features that go into making up your lung allocation score. As mentioned, they include your age, your diagnosis, whether you have diabetes, what your six minute walk distance is, whether you require assisted mechanical ventilatory support, how good your kidneys work, and how good your heart works. Although the lung allocation score system is relatively flexible and can be updated, there are several features unique to some disease processes that are not included in the score. These include the severity of the infections you may have, the antibiotic sensitivities of the infections and the changing antibiotic sensitivities of your infections, the occurrence of hemoptysis, recurrent holes in your lungs or pneumothoraxes, the levels of your preformed antibodies, and how frequently you're undergoing exacerbations. These issues need to be taken up separately and in certain cases appealed to the Lung Allocation Appeal Board for adjustments of your lung allocation score. Retrospective analysis of survival post and pre the new LAS system have been very encouraging. Patients who are sicker are being transplanted and post transplant survival even of these sicker patients is unchanged from the pre LAS system. What has been found to be more important than your lung allocation score and your potential for one year survival is the volume of lung transplants that the center you're listed at performs. This graph depicts a survival line for patients who have been transplanted in centers that perform less than 25 transplants a year and greater than 25 transplants a year. As you can see by this graph, the more transplants the center you're listed at performs, the better the overall survival. Tampa General Hospital performs over 40 to 45 transplants on average a year. Not only is one year survival, but five year survival after lung transplant is dependent on the volume of transplants your center performs. This graph depicts the same type of findings as the one year survival graph. Those centers that perform the most transplants have the best five year survival statistics for lung transplant recipients. Once again, Tampa General Hospital averages between 40 and 45 transplants a year. What's even more shocking is the number of centers that perform over 30 transplants a year. There are only 30 recorded centers that perform on average over 30 transplants a year, where the vast majority of centers perform 19 or less transplants a year. Another relatively interesting fact about lung transplants is that most centers perform transplants on young patients, and in fact the majority of patients who undergo lung transplants are 65 or less, whereas the majority are over 65. Tampa General Hospital has one of the most active senior lung transplant programs in the country. We perform transplants on patients up to 74 to 75 years of age and we consider physiological state and age over chronological age and state. The success of lung transplant in patients over 65 has not gone unnoticed. As this graph depicts, the percentage of transplants in patients over 65 as a percentage of the total lung transplants performed has increased steadily from 1985 to 2010. When considering transplant in patients over 65, it is important to realize that patient selection is incredibly important. Mortality for patients as they grow older after lung transplant at one year increases statistically significantly. Although one year survival is worse for patients over 60 to 65, this slide depicts another interesting fact. Five-year mortality for patients over 55 and less than 30 are actually equal or perhaps even favors the patients over 55. The facts are that five-year mortality has a bimodal distribution with young people and old people doing equally as well in the post-transplant state. The initial transplant event is only one of the hurdles in the first year to two years after transplant. 
readmission to the hospital for major complications are relatively common. And in fact, 60 to 70 percent of patients will be readmitted within the first year for complications including infections, rejection, and immunosuppression complications, including diabetes, hypertension, and renal insufficiency. Post-transplant medical complications are relatively common and include chronic rejection, otherwise known as bronchiolitis obliterans, acute rejection, both humoral and cellular, various infections, including infections from viruses, bacterials, fungus, and protozoas, immunosuppression toxicity, including nephrotoxicity or renal insufficiency, significant hypertension, diabetes, elevated lipids, and post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease, or lymphomas. Careful monitoring of the post-transplant patient after transplant is essential to the long-term survival and quality of life of the patient. The incidence of hypertension in within the first year is up to 52%. Significant renal dysfunction, almost 24%. Abnormal creatinines or renal functions happen in 20 to 25% of patients. Elevated blood sugars, including insulin requiring diabetes, in up to a quarter of the patients. In the first year, bronchiolitis obliterans is seen in almost 10% of the patients, and within five years, in up to almost 40% of the patients. As the years go on, the incidence of hypertension, renal dysfunction, and diabetes increases significantly. Hence, close follow-up with the transplant team, adjustments in the immunosuppression, and aggressive management of these post-transplant complications are essential. Post-transplant survival is also somewhat dependent on the initial condition for which the patient was transplanted. Patients with cystic fibrosis have an average 7.4 year survival. Patients with idiopathic pulmonary hypertension, almost a five-year survival. Alpha-1A trypsin patients, six-year survival. And IPF patients, 4.5-year survival. This correlates almost directly with the age of which you see these diseases progress to the transplant state and transplant recipients. Interestingly, though, sex does not play a role in long-term survival after lung transplants as male and female lung transplant recipients have essentially the same survival statistics. One of the banes to long-term lung transplant survival is chronic rejection, otherwise known as obliterated bronchiolitis or bronchiolitis syndrome. It's basically a chronic fibrotic scar of the bronchioles with incidence at 1, 3, and 5 years at 12, 50, and 60%. Major risk factors include high-grade and low-grade rejection, especially during the first year, recurrent CMV infections, lymphocytic bronchiolitis and bronchitis, and viral infections, especially parainfluenza and RSV viruses. The diagnosis of bronchiolitis obliterans, or chronic rejection, is predominantly a clinical diagnosis. Bronchoscopy is successful in obtaining adequate material in less than 15% of cases. The gold standard is an open lung biopsy, however, is relatively invasive. Predominantly, we use pulmonary function testing, chest x-rays, and chest CTs to make this diagnosis. Because this disease is often irreversible and progresses at relatively variable rates, the early diagnosis and potential intervention in any reversible causes is essential, and another reason why a close follow-up with your transplant pulmonologist and caregivers is essential. Infections are a major indication for readmission after transplant. Because some of these infections can result in the development of acute and chronic rejection as well as other organ system dysfunction, the prompt attention to these temperatures over 100.5 is absolutely necessary. Your transplant pulmonologist will go over a complete review of systems, including evaluations of your sinuses, your GI tract, your lungs, your exposure history, and will be well aware of the community statistics as far as which viruses are currently in the community. Basic labs, including blood cultures, urine cultures, chest x-rays, and various specialty viral cultures will be performed. In most cases, appropriate therapy can be used to intervene and a short hospital stay is usually expected. It can't be stressed enough how important it is to contact your transplant center if you develop fevers. Bacterial infections account for 40% of the deaths in the first year after transplant and 25% in the second year. Normal viral infections and reactivation of prior viral 
microorganisms, including HSV and CMV, as well as contact with influenza and RSV can be ca catastrophic infections in the transplant patients. In addition, odd infections such as PCP and nocardia, as well as fungal infections, can damage the lungs, resulting in severe transplant organ dysfunction and even death in some cases. In the immunocompromised state post-transplant, organisms which would normally have no impact on a human being can be very deadly. Common aspergillus, a fungus that is fairly ubiquitous in nature, can become invasive, damaging the lungs, invading the sinuses, and becoming systemic, infecting the whole body of a lung transplant patient. In addition to aspergillus, more and less exotic funguses can cause infections in the lung transplant patients. More exotic including mucor and less exotic including common canada, uh, both albicans and non-tropicalis species. The treatment of course is antifungal therapy and unfortunately these medications often interact with your immunosuppressive medications and should be instituted only with caution and with close observation by your transplant physicians. Routine viruses that are relatively common in the normal population can be very problematic in the post-transplant patient. Cytomegalovirus, a virus which almost 80% of the adult population has been exposed to, can reactivate in the transplant patient, causing a variable number of clinical presentations, including pneumonitis, pancreatitis, gastroenteritis, retinitis and blindness, and meningitis and cerebritis. It can also predispose to chronic lung inject rejection when it affects the airways and tissue of the lungs. A high degree of suspicion and close observation with screening labs are necessary to prevent the outbreak and progression of this disease process. CMV infections can even affect long-term survival of the post-lung transplant patient. Because of this, our program has sophisticated screening methods to detect early activation of CMV and begin therapy before any end organ damage can occur. One very important task of you and the lung transplant program is to prevent the onset of malignancy post-transplant. Before you undergo a transplant, a careful screening will be performed to assess for early breast cancer, colon cancer, and skin cancer. In the immunocompromised state, early cancers can grow very quickly, and an initial screening and subsequent yearly follow-up and close adherence to healthcare maintenance is important to long-term survival free of cancer side effects. I'd like to end by giving you a little insight into the lung transplant program at Tampa General Hospital, its structure, and the support it receives. The lung transplant program at Tampa General Hospital was the last solid organ transplant program developed here. Heart, kidneys, and livers had preceded our program in their development. We were fortunate to use their experiences and expertise in developing our lung transplant program. The program was initiated in June of 2002 received Medicare approval in November of 2005, and was recertified by Medicare in 2008. In 2012, we did 38 transplants. In 2010, 58 transplants. In 2011, 54 transplants. We also have one of the busiest adult cystic fibrosis programs in the Southeast United States, and a very large clinical research center, specifically looking at a number of treatments for cystic fibrosis and interstitial lung disease, such as UIP. The success of the lung transplant program at Tampa General Hospital is due to its interdisciplinary nature. We have experts in immunology, hospital administration, nursing min administration and management, outcomes managers, care coordinators, financial coordinators, physical and occupational therapists, consultants who have expertise in transplants in hearts, livers, and kidneys, as well as experts in diabetes and diabetes management, as well as intensive care and surgery as part of our lung transplant team. At the backbone of our team are UNA certified transplant surgeons, UNA certified transplant pulmonologists, qualified transplant coordinators, infectious disease specialists, anesthesiologists, pathologists, and a team of support personnel from social workers, dietitians, PharmDs, psychologists, and respiratory therapists. Finally, you have the physicians of New Lung Associates. We are the lung transplant pulmonologists at Tampa General Hospital, Dr. Mark Rolfe, Dr. Tara Kadad, and Dr. Tim Floreth. 
please check us out on our website, newlungassociates.com, and at the website, lungtxp.com.